Lord Jesus, we, we will not be shaken. You are our foundation. You are our life. You are the light that gives us life. We look to you, Lord, who, who compares? No one. Lord, today we have the gift of letting your light shine into our hearts and into our minds. Speak your word to us. Speak your truth to us. Lord, help us to live into you. In Jesus' name, what? amen. Well, good morning. We are in a series where we are looking at foundational realities of life. We're utilizing the gospel of John and who Jesus is and what he reveals. And today we're focusing in on the reality of reality itself that we can know, that we can understand. And we use the word truth to talk about that. What is truth? These are actually the most famous words uttered by Pontius Pilate that, that we have. Now, when he said it, he said it probably much more with a sense of cynicism. What is truth? Cynical and ironic. The man tasked with declaring the guilt or innocence of the Son of God. Responsible for establishing the truth of the charges that meant life or death for Jesus. And he didn't even know what truth was. He didn't even recognize that truth was standing right in front of him. In some ways, to me, it feels like we live in the age of Pontius Pilate. Cynicism over truth. What is truth? Confidence in our institutions for really trying to establish truth are crumbling. Confidence in the sources of the ones who are supposed to help us discern the truth are at an all-time low. Leaders who would live lives of integrity and truth, we're looking for them. In 2016, the Oxford English Dictionary's word of the year was post-truth. Post-truth is the idea of relating to or denoting the circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than just appeals to emotion. The problem is, is it probably begins in academia. All truth is relative. There are no absolute truths. That claim rings down the halls of universities for the last 40, 50 years. All the way to Disney cartoons and video games indoctrinating the youngest of us about being skeptical about all truth claims. Of course, there are no absolute relativists. There can't be. There is cynicism on all sides. Because in our world, it does feel like most claims of truth are grabs for power. One side's truth claim, or another side's alternative facts, or another side's fake news, or another side's debunked facts checks. And round and round we have gone, and we see this in our culture, and truth is the loser. Even as there is this cynicism for truth, doesn't it build in us a longing? We want truth. We want something firm to stand on. We want reality. The longing for truth is a universal human desire. Aristotle claimed that all men by nature want to know. We want to understand reality. We want answers to questions to help ground us so that we can live our lives in the grain of the universe. We want what is real and authentic and firm and actual, which, which are all just words for truth. Very few of us would willingly choose to live into a lie over living into reality. We'll do it sometimes, but 
If it's the big choice, we want what that which is authentic. C.S. Lewis claimed one of the things that separates humanity from animals is that we want to know things. We want to find out what reality is like simply for the sake of knowing. When that desire is completely quenched in us, he writes, I think we have become less than human. You know, maybe nothing proves that desire, that quest, that longing to know reality than little children. And the quest for truth begins here. The insatiable desire. So, Daddy, why are you building that table? So we have a place to eat. Well, why do we eat? So we can live. Why do we live? Well, we were made to know God and enjoy him forever. Well, why does God want to know us? Because he wants to be friends. And on and on this will go. Again, that's where the quest for truth begins. With wonder and awe and questions and exploration. When we cease our questions, when we cease our exploring, when we no longer long for the truth of things, we are diminished. So today I want to invite you into an exploration of the Gospel of John and answering this question, what is truth? The Gospel of John chants the answer over and over. We hear the claims of truth, the way of truth. Jesus is the truth. And it's sung like this beautiful worship song. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. I want to begin our exploration with perhaps the most comforting and well-known claim of truth in the entire Gospel of John. Maybe in the entire Christian faith. This is John 14, verse 6. This is Jesus speaking. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, it, it needs to be admitted, I think, that not everybody finds these words comforting. In our culture, in our context today, Jesus is making an absolute claim, saying that he is the one way to God. And in a culture that promotes relativism, and in certain quarters is actually opposed to Christianity, the claim that Jesus is the way appears offensive. I get it. I was there once. I remember what it was like to think that, well, pretty much religion doesn't matter, and, well, if they are, if there is any truth in them, they're all probably relatively true, and how arrogant it would be for one of them to claim that they are the way and all the other ones in some way are ultimately false. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but if it's, if it's a hang-up, if it's a problem, I want to begin by just observing that we make this claim as Christians because Jesus made the claim. And I get that it sounds offensive for me to say that Christianity is absolutely the, the way, the truth, and it's the only way of salvation. And it sounds arrogant. But I want to invite you in because this happened for me. Jesus made the claim, and he has this amazing ability where for anybody else it may sound arrogant, and him it didn't. And I want to show you in a minute that the way that he makes this claim is not arrogant, but it's about comfort and love and care and concern. But it also needs to be observed that one of the reasons it sounds offensive is that we have probably many of us that come and accepted the idea that there are different types of truths. And there's scientific facts. And then there's religious truth claims and that these two things are different. Almost nobody would say that it's offensive to say that 2 plus 2 equals 5 is wrong. Or that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is right. Or that CO2 is not the um, atomic symbols for water. 
It's carbon dioxide, it's not water, that's H2O. And you see in our society, those sorts of things, we would say, okay, well, those are facts and they're true. But, but science is not the only place that has truth. What we're saying is, is that truth itself, fundamental to his nature, is that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And what we're claiming is, is that there is actually a moral order and there is actually a God, and there's truth and reality about God, and you can be mistaken about who he is. Third, to claim there are no moral religious absolutes is in itself an absolute claim, and it's every bit as arrogant or as offensive as if to say there is one way. That's the self-defeating part of absolute claims. Fourth, it may sound offensive, but you know, sometimes reality is offensive. Uh, yesterday I was putting together glue. I was gluing some PVC pipes together and the smell was offensive. I mean, you, you know, you're just, whoa. Uh, you know, I mean, it just, it's, it smell. You know, my son was just, dad, this is awful. Do we have to do this? And every once in a while, you know, you're gonna be in a place and reality is gonna hit you in the face and you may not like it at first, but there may be some good involved with it. But let me tell you the first great lesson about truth. It's the most important. And it's how this statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life comes to us, and it comes to us as comfort and hope and life and love. The fundamental, fundamental nature of truth is that it is not abstract, it is not cold, it isn't contained in just words. It's a person. Truth is fundamentally personal. He's warm. He's loving. He's compassionate. Jesus was with his 12 apostles. This is the final night before his crucifixion. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He prepared an elaborate meal. He's preparing them. He knows that the next day he is going to go and he's going to die. He knows that this is going to be hard for them, that they're going to be scattered, that they're not going to understand what's going on. He shares a meal with them to prepare them, to continue to show his love and his concern. He, he gets down. He washes their feet. He shows them the extent of his love. He gives them a concrete action so that tomorrow they can begin to frame what's going on. And then after the meal, he takes them up and he starts talking about them. And he tells them, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And, and, and I'm going to come back, and you're going to end up being with me forever, and it's going to be okay. For a little while, it's going to be hard, but it's going to be okay. And don't worry. I'm going to go, and if I go, I'll come back. And these are some of the most comforting words that we are given in the entire scriptures. They're, they're said at almost, I mean, they're probably the most quoted statements at funerals and memorial services because this is what Jesus was saying in the face of death and it's his promise of life and that death isn't the end and he's giving them these words and he's comforting them and, and, and they go, how do we go there? What's the way? And he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing that, you know, we can describe reality with math. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that we can take something like E equals MC squared and we can, use, we can use a formula to sit there and describe reality. But at the end of the day, reality is not an abstract mathematical formula. Ultimate reality is a person. It's Jesus Christ, and he is warm, and he is caring, and he's loving, and you can go to him and you can talk to him. He doesn't give a principle. He doesn't give a duty. He doesn't give five steps to highly effective godliness. He gives himself. I am the way. 
I am the truth. I am the life. It's just me. Just focus on me. Don't worry, I'm with you. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you a test that you won't be able to answer. What problems are you facing? What obstacles are blocking your path? How are you feeling overwhelmed, stressed, anxious, fearful, confused, or disoriented? When you are feeling overwhelmed with life, Jesus is the way. Go to him. He wants to comfort us. He wants to help us. He wants to give us truth. He wants to give us a firm foundation, just what we say. Embrace him as your way, your truth, your life. He's with you and he's for you. And this is this part where, you know, it's bringing this home and it's beginning to live in it. The, the disciples didn't understand it in the midst of it, but then later they did. But it gets to this point where you may not understand exactly what's being told, but let me tell you that down the road, you end up, you start leaning on him as your truth. Jesus, I know you're the truth. I know you're the way. I'm a little bit confused. I need your help. I'm coming to you. I'm turning to you. Will you help me? And he knows and he understands. And what's amazing is, is that what Jesus says on the night before he was crucified really wasn't any different than what he was saying at the beginning. Ask, seek, and knock. Anyone who asks, they will be given the answer. Anybody who seeks, they will find. Anyone who knocks, the door will be opened. If you turn to me, if you look to me, I will be there. You want help to overcome problems? Jesus knows. He knows the whole story and he knows the way through you want hope in the face of death jesus is the life you want comfort when you are in trouble jesus is the way he knows all your problems he knows all your feelings there is nothing beyond him nothing confuses him nothing is too difficult for him you can go and you can ask and while Jesus is physically absent with us, he is not absent-minded nor caring because he is present by his spirit, the spirit of truth that dwells not out here, but actually in here. And he's closer to us now than he was when, when he was here in his body with his disciples. You want a practical step of living the way, the truth, and the life? In your very next problem, go to Jesus and start problem solving with him. Talk to him about the problem. Tell him how you feel about it. To ask him your questions. And invite him in to help bring you into the truth so that you can walk in his way. Truth is ultimately personal. This is the greatest truth. And it is good news. Truth is also revelatory. It, it's like a giant light that allows you to see the way things really are. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Follow me and you will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Now, Jesus could have and he can make this claim at any point that he wanted to. He could make it to anyone. He could make it to anywhere. He could do it at any time. But there was a special place, a special moment, where he stood up and he made this claim. And that context where he made it makes it all the more amazing. John tells us that Jesus made the claim during the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles. Now, there were three major Jewish festivals that were prescribed in the Old Covenant. And um, if, you, if you lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem, you were required to go and participate in these festivals every year. Um, and this is the part where, you know, we, we, are, we are actually commanded to celebrate. This is good for you. We were made for this. Go and have a good time. 
You know, I mean, ow, wow, that just sounds terrible, doesn't it? But no, that's the way it was. And the three festivals were Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. But by, 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 by a long shot, the favorite of the festivals was the Festival of Tabernacles. A tabernacle means a tent. It was an eight-day celebration t- sometime in the fall, typically mid-October. The worshipers would come, and for these eight days, they would live in tents, and they were recalling the days of their ancestors wandering through the wilderness, and they were remembering that God had saved them, and then he had led them in the desert for 40 years, and he was with them. And during the day, he was a pillar of cloud, and at night, a pillar of fire that gave light to the entire camp. God came and tented among them. They celebrated this. It was there now in that week long celebration there were three great acts of worship they would do. There was a water ceremony, there was a light ceremony, and then there was a liturgy that would be that would be sung out and be um, spoken. Now, for time's sake, we're just going to focus on the light ceremony. I'd love to teach you the other two things, but we don't have time for that. On the first night of the feast, four huge candelabras were set up in the center of the temple courts, which was called the Court of the Women. Um, This was a large area. Um, All Jewish people could gather in this area. And when I say big, to light the candelabras, they had to climb a ladder to get up on top to light these. And um, they were, they, they, each candelabra had four bowls, and they were filled with oil. They used um, priestly garments as the wicks, and they would light the um, candelabras. And it would give light. Historical records actually tell this, that, it, that the light from these candelabras illuminated all of Jerusalem. And they would, they would stay up late singing and praising and celebrating God's presence among them. And the light ceremony, what it recalled, was God's presence, but in particular, his guidance. There were, you know, in in the days of the wilderness wandering, they didn't have maps. They didn't have GPS. They didn't have freeways. It was a dangerous thing to be out in the wilderness. If you didn't know where water was, if you didn't know where you were going, it was easy to get lost. People get lost today. We still have all that stuff. They didn't have any of that stuff. But they had the one who was better. They had God. And God was with them, leading and then guiding them. And they would would sing about this. They would praise us. They realized to be able to live in the light of God, to have him be our leader, to have him show our way, there is nothing better. Psalm 78, one of the songs that they would sing during this Feast of Tabernacles. We will tell the generations to come... The praise of the Lord. That they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God. He divided the sea. He led them by a cloud during the day. And all the night was a light of fire. They would sing it out, other psalms, the reality of who he is. And they would say that he is our light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Oh, send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. For seven nights, they would celebrate the light that God gives them, the way that he would lead, that he shows them reality, that he gives them his word. On the eighth night, the candles were extinguished, and then they would look forward for a year to the ceremony all over again, where they actually had light in the darkness. It was on the eighth night, Jesus was walking And John tells us this in the very place that the candelabras had been lit. And then he stood up and he proclaimed, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. He waited until the candles went out when they were in darkness, but they had tasted it. They had enjoyed it. They had just spent a week celebrating the reality of God's presence and his light, piercing the darkness. And then Jesus gets up and he says, if you follow me, there will not be light for just seven joyous nights. But there will be light every night 
and every day. My light will not flicker out. It will not be exhausted in a week. I am the light that never goes out. It is a staggering claim. But it is given with the same sense of comfort. The same sense of personalness of I am the way, the truth, and the life. Stay close to Jesus, seek him, follow him, and he will show you how to live. Jesus, he reveals God. God's invisible, and now we can sit there and say, the invisible God has been made known in the face of Jesus Christ. And if I ever have any question about what God is like or what he looks like or his character or his nature, all you have to do, all I have to do is look at Jesus Is God looking at me, shaking his finger, wanting to bring down the hammer? No. No, not at all. His arms are open wide. He's loving, he's accepting, he's comforting. He wants to save you, he wants to rescue you. He smiles down upon you. Jesus reveals God. He also shows God's plan for our life. God knows you by name. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper, not to harm you. He wants to show us the way. I, I, I um, had the chance to share my story a little bit on um, Friday. And um, you know, I'm a big planner. And, um, you know, like years out, I had my whole life planned out. And then I became a Christian. And then it all came home and I was sitting at this retreat listening to the realities of who Jesus is and that he's supposed to be the leader of our life. And I had this sense of, wow. And, I, and, and some of you have heard this before, but this is like this, one of the strongest times in my life where I kind of felt like I saw like this vision of Jesus sitting on the throne of heaven and he said, are you going to play at this thing? Or are you going to follow me? And I knew exactly what he said. And I knew what, exactly what the words meant. Up to that point, I had fit Jesus into this nice little compartment in my life. I was going to make lots of money. I was going to go be an engineer. I was going to climb a corporate ladder. I was going to get to the top. I was going to be married. I was going to have 2.2 kids. And I was going to drive a Porsche. And it was all planned out. And then Jesus interrupted that. But, okay, well, now I've got heaven taken care of. And I'll go to worship on Sunday. But now it's still my life with me in charge. And I knew that that's not the way it is. He's supposed to be my God. He's supposed to be my leader. This isn't about me fitting Jesus into my life. This is about me worshiping the one true God. I believed you lived. I believe you died. I believe you rose from the dead. I don't want to, and I, I don't want to play at this thing. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. And right then, boom, the, the speaker was done. Everybody's getting up, and my whole world is shaking because I don't know what I'm going to do. Nothing makes sense anymore because now, I mean, I got this new reality, and it's not about money. And I'm walking outside and my world's kind of tilting and I don't know what is my future. And for me, that feels really scary. And then 100 feet away, I see the, the college pastor walk by. And I hear a voice in my head that says, you could do that. If you give your life to the Lord, he will show you the way. He will reveal his plans. It may not be immediately. It may not be right away because some of it's training you up and you need to learn patience and other things and sometimes the timing's just off. But Jesus has come. Truth is personal. He is the way. He wants to share life with you and he has a plan for you. You are not some random accident in the universe. He knows you by name. Truth is personal. Truth is revelatory. And truth is liberating. Right after he makes this claim of being the light of the world, the Jewish leaders come and they begin to attack. And they question, by what authority? And it was right into the midst of that context that Jesus then said, if you hold my teachings, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And we've talked about freedom. 
and it is an aspect of truth to it. There's freedom from and there's freedom for. One of the things that I'm loving about just this series and talking about these realities, justice, spirituality, beauty, truth, they intersect, they co here, they go together. I want to take this idea of truth is liberating and I want to tie together two things. The idea of freedom for and the spirituality that we talked about last week. You and I have a soul. We're embodied spiritual creatures. The, one of the reasons, you know, religion is on the wane in our culture, but spirituality is still very much um, popular, acceptable. Sometimes maybe any sort of spirituality other than Christian spirituality, because again, there's a little bit of rejecting the absolute claim that Christianity makes. One of the attractions of spirituality is this. It's kind of amorphous. You can kind of, people just kind of, it, it's, it's about my personal feelings and it's about the interior stuff. We don't believe in any just sort of spirituality. What we believe in is Christian spirituality. About the spirit of God coming and living inside of us. And he is the spirit of truth and the spirit of goodness and the spirit of power and the spirit of life. And he is the spirit of Christ. It is a type of spirituality that has a specific form. You can't just shape it into any form that you want. That's idolatry. But this is where true freedom comes. Because freedom isn't just freedom from, it's freedom for. And you and I were made to look like Jesus. And so when we talk about this life and this life with God and the spirit inside of us, we have an idea of what the spirit wants to do. There is an aim for Christian spirituality. Concrete and definite form. The spirit moves as the spirit wants, but the spirit always wants to move in the way of Jesus. He is the form. He is the life. His character One of my favorite scenes in the Gospel of John is John chapter 18, where the soldiers have taken Jesus and they have beaten him and whipped. And I, I mean, that's not my favorite part, but it's coming. But they, you know, and they've dressed him up and they've put a, a robe on him and a crown of thorns. And he just takes it. And and then Pilate has him come out and they bring him out dressed this way. And Pilate is standing before the crowds. And one of the things that happens in John's gospel is oftentimes people say more than they realize. Because this is about what's going on with God's plan and purpose. So that as we read, we can hear and then we can know the truth. And in that moment, when Pontius Pilate has... Jesus brought out, the very first words that he ha says is, behold the man. And it has all the force of behold the human one. And right here is being revealed to us what true humanity looks like. What we were made for. What God was aiming at when he said that we're going to be his image bearers. It is the self-giving, sacrificial love of Jesus Christ that does what his father calls him to do. Not all of us are going to have the same opportunities to suffer in Jesus' name. We're not going to looking for suffering. The joyful part isn't the suffering. But the joyful part is when we're called to love and we do it regardless of the cost. And that's what happens right there in that moment. And we see that's what you and I were made to look like. Lovers who are willing to be dressed up and mocked and ridiculed because they don't know what they're doing so that we can save them. If you want to embrace the truth in your life, it's going to be you following Jesus in such a way that his love gets formed in you 
regardless of the cost. And then when you do that, you will truly be free. Love is personal. Love is, or truth, same thing. Truth is personal, truth is revelatory, truth is liberating, and truth is reliable. I remember listening to a UW professor whose field of study is developmental molecular biology, John Medina, and he was talking about how amazing our brains are and that they're hardwired to to understand and begin to make sense of reality. This is how God designed us. He designed us for truth. He designed us so that we could understand reality. And this is great advice for parents, but this is also really good advice for all of us of understanding truth. So he says that when little kids are little kids, you know, they, they enter into this terrible twos or threes, but he says that's just their brains learning to develop. And what they're really trying to do is they're trying to test to see, will this hold me? Their world is expanding and they're, they're exploring and they're trying to understand how reality works. And so they keep testing. They want to know where can I step and it will hold and so all that testing that drives you crazy as a parent, as your kid, and you go, no, no, no. And he says, the best thing you can do is just be patient and kind. They're not just trying to rebel as little sinners. That's not what's going on. Their brains are sitting there. Is this reality? Can this hold? So Jesus is the truth. And now let me tell you something about just what this word means in the context of how John tells the story, and I'll take it back to that analogy. In Exodus 34, Moses has been up on the mountain, and he's received the law, and he's, and, um, he's been doing God's work. And he asks God, he says, God, I want to see your glory. And God says, you can't handle my glory, but I'll show you my backside. And so he has Moses take the two tablets and he climbs into this cleft of the rock. And then what happens is, is that the glory of the God passes by, but not in all the full radiance of the glory. And glory here is light. Now, what ends up happening is, is the actual radiance of the glory is God saying his name. Yahweh, Yahweh, I am, I am, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. There is beauty, there is light, there is glory, there is truth, there is love, there is justice, all here in this expression of who God is. And at the heart of it, Abounding in love and faithfulness. The words there for love and faithfulness are hased and emet. They ring out through the entire Old Testament. And in John chapter 1, verse 14. John tells us the word became flesh and tabernacled, tented among us. Remember the Feast of Tabernacles? We have seen his glory, his light, his life, his radiance. We have seen his glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. The grace and truth there is a reference back to Hesed and Demet. Part of, and, and, and that word amet is the regular word in the Old Testament gets translated the same word here in Greek in the Greek translation. And, and it's, this is ringing out. Truth is reliable. Reality is reliable. It's real. You can step on it. It will hold. The most reliable thing in the entire universe is a person. He is more reliable than the substance of the, his creation. 
You can rely on him for everything and in any situation. He will be faithful. He will be good. He will be true. So I want to come full circle. And I want to bring this back to this picture of a child who goes and is asking questions of their father. Why are you making the table so we have a place to eat? Why do we need to eat so we can live? At the end of the day, as we understand what life is really about, we have a God who's our father and our brother and our savior and our lover and he is absolutely reliable and good. And he wants to share life with us. And he will disclose and make known to us that which is real and true and good and beautiful. So go to him. Explore with him. Put your weight on him. Because he can hold whatever problems that you face, whatever difficulties that you have, Whatever obstacles may be before you, turn to him because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you call us to yourself. You want to give us comfort. You want to give us help. You want, you've come to us. You want us to live into reality. You want the very best for us. And what we find is truth is not abstract. It's not a test. You are the truth. And your truth wants to set us free. You want to show us how to live. You want the very best for us. But we need your words. We need your way. We need your strength. At our best, we don't want to live the lie. But every once in a while, each one of us chooses the lie. Sometimes we speak it. Sometimes we shape our lives by it. Sometimes we live in the darkness. But what you want to do is you want your light to shine into every recess of our heart. And like the very best radiation therapy that gets rid of all the cancer, you want your light and your truth to expose. And every once in a while it may feel offensive and difficult and challenging and hard. And we may wonder if you really love us. Help us to see. Help us to live. May we live by your words, your truth, your way. In Jesus' name. Amen.